Are you ready? You're good to go. Okay, well, for those of you that trekked up here, we appreciate it. Uh, what I want to talk about today is some of the work that goes on in my lab. Um, as, as my group of uh, Texan students would say, they do all the work and I do all the, the funding of them, uh, which is absolutely true. Um, and so what I want to do is talk about Gulf sturgeon. It's a threatened species on the, uh, uh, the federal uh, listing. It's also uh, threatened or endangered on every state that it occurs in, in terms of state uh, designation. And, and these are the folks that uh, Jean-Marie, who did her master's thesis with me, who's now at Tech, Paul Grammer's at Tech, Paul Mickles, you'll see later he's a postdoc, and Todd Slack is at the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers in Vicksburg. He was at the Mississippi Museum of Natural Science for about 12 years, and he started a lot of this work. Uh, uh, back in 1997, and so it's a very collaborative effort. Uh, there's been a huge amount of work going into it, and it's it's been fun, but it's been frustrating because they are sort of rare individuals. And if you've not seen one, maybe not quite as charismatic as a whale shark, but equally as important, and probably more more diagnostic of how our environment's doing in terms of maintaining that uh, integral connection between marine waters and fresh water. Again, there's Paul, there's Jean Marie. J.D. was a former student, and this is a fellow at the museum that came down to help us. We caught that in the Pasigula River a, a couple of years ago. So sturgeon are interesting. They're, they're the most threatened group of fishes pretty much on the planet. Uh, and it's because they have this anadromous lifestyle. They spend a lot of time in marine environments. They spend a lot of time up in freshwater environments where they spawn, and then they hang out for a good bit of time. Many of them do that. Some of them don't do that depending on which ones you're talking about. But the real problem tends to be the caviar trade. They were, they were highly uh, impacted by fishing for eggs. Habitat alteration is probably the second most abundant. Most of this has been curtailed worldwide, although in, in Europe it, uh, the populations are still fairly large and they continue to do that. Habitat alteration tends to be the biggest problem uh, where they've, they've lost gravel in streams is where they spawn on gravel bars and such. Uh, those have been mined for roads and various other things. Uh, when you buy gravel to put in your yard, that's where it's coming from. Habitat fragmentation is sort of coupled with habitat alteration, particularly dams, because remember, these things move from offshore to onshore, and if there's a wall in the way, they can't get up to spawning sites, which impacts their reproductive uh, 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 future, if you will, because females aren't reproductively active until they're about 12, males about 9 years, and so it, they're long-lived species, and it, it takes a while. Water quality degradation, IUCN, uh, considers them uh, one of the more critically endangered groups in the planet. There's eight species in North America, and only one of those is listed. That it, one of those is not listed on the Endangered Species Act. So they're they're very much impacted throughout their range. In our neck of the woods, in the Gulf, you can see here the Gulf. We're located about there, and what, that most of what we'll be talking about is in the Pascagoula system here. For locals, you'll you'll know exactly what it is. But this is sort of the the current range of where they are. There's an Atlantic form. Uh, uh, that was once connected when this was below sea, uh, sea level, uh, Atlantic sturgeon, but this is a subspecies uh, of that group. And these rivers in red are where there's a consistent amount of uh, research going on with a bunch of different, uh, both state, federal, and university and private entities, and we're focusing more of our time uh, right in this area here. Uh, a couple things I've mentioned. I'll go through this quickly. Uh, they have strong site fidelity. They actually like salmon do, they go back to the rivers that they were spawned in in most cases. It's about 90% good. We do get some mixing with the pearl population and vice versa. Uh, the, there's genetic work being done that, that's trying to ferret that out in a better way. As I mentioned, uh, they're inter, the uh, male, uh, females are what are called intermittent or skip spawners. They spawn every two to five years depending on which population you're talking about and who has the most data. Uh, they tend to enter fresh water between February and April. They're coming back in right now as we speak. Uh, non sporters can come in a little bit earlier. What they will do is they will move all the way upstream, and the spawning site that we know about in the Pasigula is in the Leaf River just south of Hattiesburg. We believe there's another one in Chickasahay further north towards Meridian, but we don't really know that. They spend anywhere from six to eight months in freshwater just sort of hanging out. They don't feed much. They sit on the bottom in what we call holding areas, and I'll show you a few of those. Then they migra migrate back out to the, the Bear Islands, September, October, November, and they spend a bunch of time. The adults spend a bunch of time feeding there. The younger fish stay in the estuaries, and we're spending a lot of our time looking at those uh, individuals. Maximum size is about 2.2 meters, about 25 years of age. And again, uh, age of maturity for males is lower than females. So the areas we've been working on 
is the Pascagoula River. Uh, here, here's where it is. This is Ship Island right here, which is this island here. And the watershed for the Pascagoula is fairly large in our state. And like I said, the spawning areas up around Hattiesburg, our holding areas are down in this area here. Chickasahay, uh, they think that there might be some spawning there. And I'll, we'll talk about these in sequence because we started the work in, in the Pascagoula uh, early on, or Todd did. This is a sort of a close-up shot. Uh, this is the, the spawning area. This is the holding areas. And this is where we spent a lot of our time downriver, for those that are familiar with the river. Uh, what we do, we do a lot of things. We, we, there's a, a number of things that happen. This is one of our fish here. Uh, you can sort of see a tag right there. Uh, we capture it. We take length and weight. We, we can categorize it based on size. And we use these data to understand where they're spending their time based on what size they are, little ones and big ones, if you will. Uh, um, and we, we, do, we, we measure things like total length, standard length, body weight. We take a fin clip to try to age them. We take a genetic uh, code that goes up to Hattiesburg to look at where these animals were born effectively. We can do that. And we tag them with, with a, uh, and I'll show you that in a minute, with some of these acoustic tags and different kinds of tags. You notice that you don't see any pictures of me. I'm really taking the pictures but from, from my office. But we use very large gill nets, sometimes smaller gill nets, depending on the size of fish we're looking for, and they can be in slightly different places. Uh, it's, a, it's a tremendous amount of work, as, as most of my people will tell you. And as I said, we measure a bunch of different things. We put in a, 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 another kind of tag called a pit tag, and that's inserted under the skin, and you have a wand over it. It's like when they barcode stuff in a store, you sort of pass it over this thing. Well, this is a scanner that will give you a, a code, and that code will tell you, based on your database, what fish it is, where you collected it, what size it was. If you recapture it, it'll to be able to calculate growth rates and things like that, which are all important to manage these species. And we put these tags on. Uh, if they're big fish, greater than 130 centimeters, about a meter and a half roughly, we put in very large tags. And we have to do surgery. We all had to go to school with fish and wildlife to learn how to do this because these are threatened species. Uh, it's it's, it's uh, not very straightforward to get permission to do these things. That's Paul Grammer doing that. Here's one of the fishes that's sort of medium size we put. There's our big tag. That's our external tag for smaller fishes. And we have a, a spaghetti tag, and then we insert the pit tag underneath. So we've got multiple ways, multiple redundant ways to track an animal. If that tag falls off, which it has in the past, this might be available, or the pit tag will be available, so we won't lose all that information. Um, and so what we do is we put out these VR2Ws. These are the uh, uh, receivers. Those tags, when the fish swims by within maybe 750 meters close to this buoy that would be floating out in the water, it'll, uh, the tag pings every 90 seconds and it sends off a sound that these will pick up and they'll record on a, on a chip and then we can go download that and we can figure out which fish swam by which buoy at a certain time of day. We can tell if it's day or night. We can tell you know, what day it is. And we can put these things out and I'll show you some of those arrays later. Uh, to be able to automatically figure out where these guys are. The early work that was done by Steve Ross and, and Todd Slack, was they, were, they didn't have this technology, they didn't have a lot of money at that time, because these are about $1,500, $1,800 just for the receiver, and then you've got to build all this stuff, and you've got to anchor it, and there's, there's a lot of cost to this stuff. So they would go out manually, and they would track manually with just a receiver where they would randomly pick a spot over there, and they would wait for 30 seconds, and they would try to figure out, is there a fish nearby? And if they didn't, then they would move to another spot. So you could miss a whole bunch of stuff. With these acoustic arrays, you have a much better chance of, of picking up fish when they're swimming by. And again, these are the kind of fishes we're talking about. Uh, um, and, and it takes a lot of work. This is the lower Pascagoula. This is here where it meets Mississippi Sound. If you come up the river, uh, this is 90 in the railroad track, and there's I-10. Um, we put out the, these circles. This is a GIS map. These circles are 750 meters across. So we know, that we know the diameter. So when a fish swims anywhere within there, assuming all the conditions are pretty good, uh, those uh, um, signals will be picked up by the receiver. And then we just go down every two or three weeks, and we download those to the laptop computer, and then we start working on what to do with those. And initially, when we started, we got involved with Todd Slack and his group when he was at the museum. They had data from 97 to, I think, 03. And then we picked up in, uh, in early 08 and, and, and started. we've been collaborating on that since then. We have some upstream sites, what we call the North Array, the South Array, and the Mouth Array, none of which is really that important. But it sort of shows you early on we didn't have a lot of these buoys. We didn't have a lot of money. 
be able to do this stuff. And so uh, w w there's gaps in here where fish could get by. But we, f we found some very interesting sorts of patterns. And you can see this is an example of the, the down end, the, the south, and the mouth array. And these arrows relate to fishes of different size. They're color-coded. So you can see where they migrate, and you've got arrowheads. And so recall, if we go, if we go back one, whoops, you know, this is the whole, pretty much most of the river that, that we sample in. There's, there's, uh, you can move down here, then you can come along this way on what's called the east branch, or you can come on the west branch in, uh, in terms of where the sturgeon can move. And so this is the east side, this is the west side, and this is Mississippi Sound, this is Senior River Island, Gauthier's right over here. Uh, and so you can see some of them come down the east side, and they go through this little cut here called Bayou Chemin, which is something we didn't know about, because, you know, this is the... the, the the uh, shipyard, and that's pretty much altered. The habitat is, is, is pretty much impacted. But once you get up about here, it starts getting a little better, and over here is pretty good besides homes. And so what we tend to find is fish will come in from offshore. They'll come up this way, and a lot of them will go up the east side. A few will go up that way. When they come back down, they come back down. They come down the east side. One or two of them sort of go down through the, the, uh, uh, the shipyard, but most of them tend to go this way. And so it's an interesting sort of pattern that we had not predicted we would find, uh, and it's useful in terms of conservation of the species because there's a lot of talk about hardening this area, about impacting it, bulkheading, filling in a bunch of spaces, and so on and so forth uh, uh, for development. And, it's, it, and what we would, would probably argue is that the fish would have no real clean way to get in, and that would impact the recovery of this species. This is just another example of how much time they spend. And each of these are a buoy, and so you can, you can look at where the movement patterns. There's a few over here, but not many. Um, and so the other thing we're able to do early on is look at benthic availability. Data. These fish have barbels that hang off the bottom of their mouth. They grow around in the sediment, and they sieve all the sediment for food. And so one of the things, there's, there's two groups of uh, agencies that handle threatened and endangered. There's fish, U.S. Fish and Wildlife that deals with critical habitat issues. So that's the bottom. Okay. Then there's NOAA that deals mostly with the animal itself the surgeon. And both of them work together. And so what we're trying to do is look at the kind of food available in the sediment in some of these areas uh, relative to where the fish spend a lot of time, particularly the smaller ones. And so we're able to get some data that was collected just before Katrina. Uh, we didn't have the data. We didn't have the money to do that. But we're able to plot these in a, in a, uh, um, a GIS map that allows us to say where are the fish spending their time, what size are the fish, and what food's available there get an idea of this sort of connecting the habitat with where the animal spends time because what humans tend to do is they alter the habitat and that can affect where these animals will go and how well they'll be able to move back up in this continuous sort of uh, connectivity between offshore islands and, and, and the upriver spawning sites. And so you can see on the east side there's a lot of time uh, that they spend there. And this is just another example at a different time of the year. Again, they're spending a bunch of time. And again, some do come over here, but it's not very often you see them going there. Because remember, there's a big ship channel here. There's a lot of traffic. One more sort of uh, 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 fall collection, just again to show you they're spending a bunch of time there. And so if we look at this, we took that benthic data, and we looked at sand. This is a GIS map. This is Senior River Island. And all the red stuff means it's a lot of sand, okay, as you would expect because we have a lot of sandy, muddy environments here, more so than, than east, where you find a bigger population of sturgeon. But you tend to find these, these are what we call the rabbit islands, this is the deltaic islands from the river. A lot of sand up here, if we look at arthropod, this is, these are like amphipods and isopods, crustaceans, things that, uh, little bugs that, that animals uh, uh, feed on that are surface dwellers, they tend to be, again, right along these areas where you find a lot of time. And again, they're spending a bunch of time here if we look at annelids, which are worms in the mud, again, there's a big area up here, that, uh, and there's some out in here, but mostly up in here in this sort of natural area uh, for annelids, both of which are really major prey items in the diet of sturgeon. And then this is pretty much everyone else bulked together, and there's some, some, city here, some uh, uh, high abundances here as well. And the key is, is, are they spending a lot of time where there's food that's predicted to be the kind of food they would eat? And the answer is, for our early limited data, the answer is, yeah, we think that's very true. And it tends to be in the natural side of the uh, Passangula River.